<laughs> um, so Gavin Townsley is a writer and an educator, originally from the Pacific Northwest. He is currently working on two collections, a short story series about the missed opportunities for intimacy between people and communities, and a flash fiction collection highlighting the struggle of a man coming to terms with being a single parent. After these, he might get started on that sci-fi novel he has been dreaming about. And I will add, he was also last year's Velro co-curator. So, thank you, Gavin. actually from uh, my sci-fi book I'm um, So what you need to know about this chapter is essentially there's this process called the melding and it allows two people to experience um, each other's memories uh, firsthand but you live them through the like the, the like the memory body of the other person. Um, so uh, David is living, um, he's just been uh, clicked over into the melding and he's going to experience um, now his uh, wife's memories. Um, so, hang on. <laughs> David stood in the dry grass looking out over the sprinkler at the surrounding mix of pine and juniper trees. He wiggled his toes in the cool damp of the grass and wondered how long he'd been right here, the moment, the piece of space. The lawn seemed to extend well into the field, full of brushing winds, and then further into the junipers themselves. He closed his eyes and listened to a fountain, the water bubbling over round spotted stones. I loved it here, a voice said or thought. David opened his eyes, and the grass was now a bridge arched over a black creek bordered and shored with banks of snow and tall green shoots of bamboo. The surface on one of the banks stretched and pulled as, she, as silk sheets from a bed, and it formed into a spun bundle until it began to walk on two reed-like legs, a red-crowned crane. David had seen this same bird before, though this one seemed more important to him. He reached the tips of his fingers, spread them into the air like black, outstretched feathers. Take a picture, she said. David grabbed the camera. Why don't you lean up there, David said. I want that cherry tree in the background. A woman leaned into her elbows on the wood rail and smiled back at him. She itched her freckled nose with the back of her hand. He loved the delicate underside of her wrists. David smiled. She looked younger than he remembered. What was her name again, he thought. Who is she? Of course I do, she said. That's good, he said. This will look great. David? A voice called. David clicked the shutter and found himself above the sprinkler, a yellow tractor with spaded wheels and two bent metal arms which fanned water over the grass. Inch by inch it crept along, guided by the track of a terracotta hose. The far end of the hose melted into a round, open platter. David saw his mother working, bleeding hearts in the soil which funneled down into a tube and snaked its way back to a tractor. It's too early to plant, David said. But his mother kept on humming something sad to herself while pulling and cutting the pebbled soil with her trowel. A child laughed under the sprinklers, which now threw the petals of a cherry blossom tree into the air like bags of soft confetti. David began to feel clo closed into a box that was immeasurably deep. His limbs caked with cold and warm pangs of a flavor, tiramisu and apple butter and watermelon. The child's laugh turned to mist David once again stood staring at the pine juniper across the field. In the dark space between boughs, his father emerged waving the red hat he was buried in. And then he saw his grandfather as a kid carrying a roll of newspaper. It folded, into, folded itself into a plane, a boat, and another crane. David's grandmother rang a triangle with the same dented ladle she used to pour hot water on him in the bath. And David laughed. I think I'm going to stop there because... Well, how long are we doing? Five. Adam will speak. No, I will <laughs> <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep going. Um, are we having a camp out early, early this year, David asked. Ruth? 
David looked around the yard, but it was gone, and he was in the old kitchen next to the coffee pot and a blue toaster he'd given Ruth when he, well, when he, when was that again? It's a terrible gift, David said aloud. I'm sorry, I'll take it back and we can choose something you want, Ruth. He called again, Ruth? The entire world settled into a stillness. He stood in the kitchen and looked at two mugs full of yellow steaming tea. Feeling his body hesitating to move, the wisps of evaporating water twisted and twirled and smelt of burnt twigs in the air. David reached out his hand and ran it across the beige countertop covered in cold ceramic tiles while thoughts began to stream through his head. Why now? Had they paid off the trailer? David knew he had, but he wasn't so sure now because he felt as though he had never seen the payments or written the checks. He hadn't even seen the trailer till he brought it home, and David ran inside to get a few eggs and a pan, telling himself to turn on the stove, to give it a whirl. And there was Bradley to consider, who he now felt much more sympathetic to. David wouldn't be happy about the money he had sent to Bradley. In fact, maybe asking the firm for a temporary position would help, just until he got back on his feet. He felt somewhat relieved and confused. Outside the window, the goldfinches chirped and fluttered in the leaves of an old cherry tree, which made David breathe out a sigh that made him feel frustrated and overwhelmed. He picked up the mugs of tea and bit his lip. He saw his fingers curled around the mug handle. His nails had been painted red, one which looked chipped and chewed at. He tasted the polish on his lips and tried to spit, but found himself unable to rid the mouth, his mouth of the taste. David walked out of the kitchen towards the dining room at the end of the hall. He couldn't remember this, or maybe this wasn't something he remembered. At the end of the dark hallway, David could see the hunched over figure of a man crying into his palms. The sound was awful, a mix of throaty gaffs and low, masculine moans that held their tones for several long seconds at a time before gasping and starting again. Agonizing, David thought. He wanted to hug this man to make him feel his confidence again. He wanted to kiss him, squeeze him, press his face into his own body until he choked out all of his pain. He wanted to remind him that 15 years was a long time at any job, but all he had were two cups of tea and nothing but hopes and unassured encouragements to offer him. He would call this firm tomorrow, he thought. They'll have something. But this was odd. David hadn't worked at any firm. He felt as though the office cut him off from the important aspects of living, toiling with his hands and the gears, and the oils, the dirt, and the mud of our existence. Yet David knew that he could call his boss, old boss Philip, the Philip that had kissed him once in the hall when he had worked late and had worn those tights, those tights David growled over. David tried to shake the image from his still head. This goes on way longer than I thought. So I'm gonna <laughs> pause there. It's a terrible stuff. Um, all right, some new stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens in that piece is he realizes he's actually Ruth. You know, but I didn't get there. Um, uh, but I want to read some of this new stuff. After she started using, it was easy to picture her dead. In the front seat of a car wreck, beneath the bubbles in the bathtub, at the bottom of the stairs, limbs twisted as much as that lost expression between her blue eyes and the lipstick on her teeth. She'd come in on the white, the white carpet, slurring through painkillers, saying, saying things that felt like they belonged to your father, what a man is, isn't. You thought of giving her a nudge once, or twice. One hit with the shovel while she was bent over the garden box. One good hit and you could drag her to the pool. You didn't hit her. You both are too much alike. And without her, there's just you. You pour her a glass of wine. Help her shaking hands light another cigarette. She blew smoke into the shimmering California air over the fountain rolling into the koi pond and the lazy drone of a bumblebee moving from purple morning glory to another. One purple morning. You're all just looking for enough for something to take home. After a few drinks, she smiled for the first time in days. Then, she told you everything she loves about her husband. This is 
something that actually started <coughs> yesterday. I'm still working on it, but like where it's going. Uh, so tentatively titled The Way a Carpenter Eats. Trees, one piece at a time. By rocking chair through cabinet drawers, my grandfather fed us all the staircase, one or two flights at a time. At meals, he wore wood shavings tangled in his arms, in his arm, in his hair, in the hairs on his arm, and smelt rich of cedar and sap, sometimes as acrid as mineral wash or a chemical glue. He took his meal at the end of the table, in the only chair with armrests. He made all seven of us find our own chairs at the table. Every meal he ate started with a glass of milk, which left a trace on his upper lip that he'd wipe off with the edge of his shoulder, sprinkling wood dust on the table. Then, he'd set in on the bread, the cabbage slaw, the pork chop, his jaws like a vice, a buzz saw, chewing through grandmother's bark. My mother would show up with no bark at all, just in the exposed quiet work of guilt set around a free meal for us kids. She earned her way at the table, with plants she couldn't afford, with labor she couldn't afford, with time she couldn't afford. The air hung thick and buzzed, stale with some potential for danger and violence. I got the same feeling walking into a, my grandfather's shop, dizzy at first, then breathless. I touched his saw once, nearly pissed myself when he came through the shop's door like he could feel me messing with some piece of him. A, tail a pale trench ran the length of his arm, a fascist gift he called it. Four fingers and a nub on the other hand, a symbol or prop he had pushed in my face, cupping the back of my neck. His sandpaper callus could work wood smooth like it worked us all smooth. My sister and I sat in silence at that table. The clink of a spoon and the pork gravy, my grandmother's third glass of wine on her teeth. Every dinner, I heard my sister, after dinner, I heard my sister ask if Grammy or Grampy even liked us. My mother leaned down, her thin olive hands better than a blanket, wrapped around her chubby cheeks, her buck tooth. She lean, leaned in and gave her a kiss, gave me a smile. My grandmother leaned against the wall, gave a wave with her pinky, passed my mother a thick envelope and said something like, maybe you'll last a month, or look at those shoes, it's embarrassing. My mother bundled up, us up in the truck, my sister snug between us, I felt her little curls on my ear she leaned, as she leaned in for the frosty drive home. The car turned on the third try, tires backing out on the gravel crunch. In the garage, my grandfather was already working on his next meal chest or an oak door, sawdust kicking out onto the floor. For a brief moment, he looked up at us, his face like petrified wood, rectangle light pouring from his glasses. He just stood there, like the sm smallest giant I'd ever seen. My mother put the truck in gear, but I still hear that roaring knock. This one's called Clarity, and it actually comes from a really interesting memory with my mother, um, which I can explain after. <laughs> uh, I've also been trying to push myself to write about subjects that are harder for me to write about, um, so this one was one of those in that series. Clarity. I rolled over in the bed and felt the sheets sticking to my ankles. My girl slipped on a robe and sat on the edge of the bed drinking from a glass of hotel wine. I took deep breaths and let the cold air from the open window fill into my lungs. She asked me why I did that after sex, that breathing. I took another deep breath and let it out. I told her fucking made me feel alive. It flicked, up, it flicked a switch in me, sex did. It made everything clear as day, like I could feel it from the very tips of me. Nipples, teeth, toes. It was all clear. The sound of the oak branches outside in the wind, the small golden moons on the light of her body, the smell of salt and cotton, crystal fucking clear. My girl took a big drink and said she wished I didn't use her like a toy all the time. I swear to God I heard my mother holding up the porn she'd found on her first computer. I was 11 and she warned me about what happens when you look at women through porn. My girl turned as she gathered her things from the chair by the coffee maker and made it crystal fucking clear. She said, all you'll ever do is fuck your wife. This one is, who 
Who is this? Who is this? I found a picture beneath the couch while my mom made minestrone soup in the kitchen. The picture was a Polaroid wrinkled and creased with a layer of dust from years beneath a piece of furniture. I wiped the picture with my sleeve and saw my mother wrapped around a man I didn't recognize. He had on a light brown jacket with strings of leather dangling from the shoulders and elbows. His eyes were blue and he had a mustache similar to my father's but black. And, this, and his hands were firmly planted on her behind, holding her up at his waist. Her face was brighter than any light I'd seen in a decade, but in the photo, but the, in the photo couldn't have been older than a few years on account of the haircut trimmed neatly at the shoulders with a distinct purple white stripe at the right of her bangs. I wondered if I'd ever seen my mother smile so wide. I asked her, who is this? Holding up the picture. She stirred the soup with an old wooden ladle, tasted it with a spoon from her apron pocket, and came and leaned over the photo. Her face shifted a little, a little. lips twisted like she was sucking a thought from between her teeth. Well, she said, that was my lover. Your lover? I asked. Yeah, she said. He helped me a lot while I was raising you kids. Wait a minute, I said, confused. You had a lover while we were kids? She would return to the kitchen, looked out the window, washing her hands of some distant thought. For a moment, I was suddenly aware of a pattern that had lingered in my life far longer than my awareness to it. Sure, she said, turning off the kitchen sink. What? You thought this world revolved around you? <laughs>